All right, I think we'll get going now. So welcome everybody uh, to historical building capture for site uh, preservation. Today's town hall will be presented to you by Bimbox, the fastest uh, production PC ever built. All of our technical specialists run on the mobile versions of the Bimbox for all of our point cloud, Revit, and rendering needs. Um, I am one of your hosts today. My name is David Gear. I've got 28 years experience in the AEC industry. I've been a CAD manager, designer, virtual design construction coordinator. Um, I have been doing AutoCAD and Revit. Uh, I just recently retired out of the Army Reserves. And I also specialize in um, augmentation services where we augment your staff and we do Revit modeling, construction documents, uh, renderings, and family buildings. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my co-host, Jean. Hi, everyone. My name is Jean Belladere. I am a senior reality capture specialist here at ATG. So I have a formal training in several Autodesk uh, pieces of software, such as uh, AutoCAD, AutoCAD Circle 3D, Inventor, 3ds Max, and Revit. I have a background in low voltage design, network infrastructure design, um, for the construction, uh, MEP, and a lot of special projects such as uh, trying to figure out how wine caves can connect together, a few uh, projects where I got flown out and we had to go into caves and mountains. And in these type of projects, I got exposed to laser scanners and the technology in the world that is reality capture today. I've worked in uh, multi-collaborational teams having to figure out how to make deliverables so that every uh, organization within the collaboration can utilize the soft uh, the deliverables so i can bring point clouds into revit 3ds max game engines turn them into mesh turn photogrammetry make them look pretty for the clients and basically i just learn new uh, ways of taking reality capture and bringing it out to the world one of my biggest um, things about reality capture is historical site preservation. I'm a big advocate of preserving culture and the way things are done. And laser scanners gives me that opportunity to do that and preserve this data so that it's never ever lost. And um, this is one of the sites that needed a little bit of, um, it needed a little freshen up. So basically, we're going to now just give a little bit of a history on the site. So the Hall of Philosophy, it was first built in 1879. The problem was is that it was built out of wooden columns, painted white, made to look like uh, some Greek Pathion uh, thing. But unfortunately, they realized shortly after it was built that this current structure was not going to last long. The whole point of this was to be a monument for people to come back to and have memories and really just, uh, you know, let it stand the test of time. So Albert Kersey was um, chartered to make the second iteration. Uh, this time, the columns were made out of solid concrete. They were Doric style, 16 columns to support the weight of the roof. The floor was poured in 1905. And you can see on the right hand side of the a slide, there are 51 little segments on the floor. This is going to be a little bit important later, but what that is, it's going to be mosaics, 51 individual mosaics that are going to be the first 51 classes of uh, the Institute in uh, Lake Chateau, New York. So this is a community based off art of the arts and science. And the first 51 classes will have a mosaic put onto the floor and their alamata will be placed on there. Now, again, the whole point about this was to preserve a piece of history so it stands the test of time. But you, the reason why we're doing this project is that as good as what they tried, it didn't really hit the mark 100%. Now, to this day, this monument is used um, as a source of inspiration for the art community. When I was out scanning, I saw several people bringing out their easels and painting. Um, there's a lot of art done of this. 
that they do host weddings. So this is also a very important part of a lot of people's memories. And preserving this data is obviously important to a lot of people. So in the next slide, I'm gonna kind of show you the hardware that I use. So we use two types of um, HDS scanners. HDS scanners are high definition survey scanners. Now, I used the BLK360 Gen 1, which is the unit on the left. Uh, recently, they uh, like it just launched two, which is on the right. I would have much preferred the unit on the right. The unit on the left, the one I use, takes about 350 points per second, as the unit on the right, the Gen 2, takes almost double that. The high dynamic range, so instead of taking with one camera and then taking six individual photos that the Gen 1 does, the Gen 2 has a 220 degree um, HDR camera. So it only needs to take two photos and then it's stitched. And because it's HDR, it's taking three brackets. So that allows you to uh, even out the Kelvins. So you get less shadows in your photos. And that just adds for more clarity and better imagery that gets posted onto your point clouds. So as a visual aesthetic, the Gen 2 uh, would have just made this look so much better. Uh, but it wasn't out yet. So there's really little I could do. Also, the integration of the BIS system, which allows the scanner itself to know how far it's moved from its last station, makes for registration purposes. Um, it, it's a way more efficient method. And it also stores the data in the unit itself. So the current method with the Gen 1 was to actually transfer the data via your I iPad or uh, Android device onto the computer. Now you can just plug in a USB-C cable straight into the 360 and it transfers straight onto your computer. It's so much quicker, all the data is there. And that just would have made a little bit of the post-processing a bit better. But um, I just had to make sure that I had a lightweight scanner because I couldn't put a 360 up and do what I do. You'll see in a minute why I need the, the small scanner. But this is basically what I needed to get. I needed to get the scanner up into the trestles. I needed to get all this intricate detail between the columns. They wanted to find out what are the gaps between these pieces of wood. What type of styles were used? Was there any alterations? Did somebody just like kind of duct tape something? You know, like they needed to know everything in there. Um, this data was going to go out to specialists in wood columns and historical sites. And they needed to find out how to like really fasten this together so that it didn't get pulled apart. And then the next slide, you're going to see the first massive obstacle. It's 21 feet, nearly 22 feet from the floor to those. I cannot bring a lift in here. There's two reasons for that. One, this beautiful monument is a giant wind tunnel. Any lift in there would have made too much vibration and movement. And there's no way I would have made the data accurate. Second of all, there, coming back to those 51 uh, mosaics, any lift driving over that would have ripped those mosaics apart. Now, my only other option, I don't have a 22 foot tripod in my backpack. I wish I did. There's just no way I can really fly around with that because we do fly. I'm located in California. And right now I'm standing in Albany, New York. I have to fly around the United States. I can't carry a 22 foot tripod with me. I was lucky enough on this project, however, to get a 20 foot, two foot ladder. Now, what am I gonna do with a 22 foot ladder? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, call it a little bit of uh, temporal insanity is what I kind of pleaded when my boss saw these photos because I duct taped and basically used a little bit of uh, zip ties and I strapped a tripod onto a 22 foot extendable ladder. It's kind of an investment. It's also another reason why I didn't want to put a $80,000 um, RTC, but uh, you know, some days you just got to do what you got to do. So. <laughs> I just read the comments. Someone just said exactly what I just said. But this was the only way I could actually get that scanner up into the tresses without having to worry about damaging the site. Well, not nearly as much and how to um, navigate going over those mosaics. So you can see on the left-hand photo, um, there are some of those mosaics. 
and they already have been ripped up because there was an audio visual company that came out and they had a roll of stuff in there and a few of those mosaics popped out now again the whole point of this operation is to just preserve the data and i have a special tripod with me that allowed me to kind of fasten it a little bit but a little bit of duct tape and zip ties i assured everybody that uh, the scanner came back fine everybody is okay and with a little bit of post registration as you can see the point cloud actually came out uh, extremely well uh, there is a little bit of um, you can see there's some whiteness underneath uh, the columns and that is just from not being able to have hdr now going back to if i had the gen 2 i would have had the high dynamic range which would have evened out the kelvins and then i wouldn't have that white blur out at the bottom uh, did i have any issues registering the scans from ground level and up there i had a little bit of issues, but um, I kind of went more onto the overscanning side. And I did make another scan that was like on the column, on the Borg style columns to kind of link them up. But you are standing between the columns. So I had to really make sure that um, I had my triangulations right because I couldn't reach that middle column. So I had to really scan around the perimeter and there is like those big partitions in the middle. Uh, so yes, registering was a little tricky, but um, obviously if I had the VIS, that would have made that so much better. But again, I didn't have the Gen 2 at the time. Uh, what is your workflow of getting the point clouds from processing to civil 3D? Oy, man, that is... Um, that that that's a big kettle of fish you're asking there, Mr. Hood. Um, well, Michelle, sorry. I usually use a piece of software from like it's called 3DR. So I like to take the point clouds and put them into 3DR, and then um, uh, I condition them that way, and then I do my subsampling. So instead of having like several gigabytes of information, I will have uh, just a couple at most a couple hundred megabytes. Uh, it's a, that is, that's a webinar in itself, but um, I can, that's probably a good idea for a webinar next time. Uh, we'll probably come to that one. Now, just kind of back to here. After, after I finished scanning, I brought this into recap and I put, I conditioned it and I got it ready for uh, Revit. Once it was ready for Revit, uh, I did my final, I got the final little check, uh, quality check done and then that was handed to David and then uh, David took over uh, the project from this point on. Um, David, do you want to kick it off? Absolutely, John. I'm, I'm actually typing in for Michelle uh, to have one of our three civil 3D specialists reach out to uh, uh, that person uh, on that. They may be able to answer the question a little bit better than you and I, because I am not a civil 3D specialist. I am one of our architectural specialists. So you well, don't I'll want be, me answering yeah. civil 3D uh, type uh, questions. Yeah, I've been working with that workflow with Terrence. We've got it down. It's um, it's a massive amount of subsampling. You just need to know how to, there's two ways of subsampling. There's spatial subsampling, and then there's, um, uh, resolution subsampling. You would prefer to do spatial opposed to resolution, which means it's amount of points spread apart from another. As resolution, it kind of acts like a, a spiral peeler, where it peels away a spiral of information. Um, so you prefer to do the spatial, and that's why I like to condition my point clouds in 3DR before they go into um, Civil 3D and Terence and I have actually got a really good workflow where we can take uh, several terabytes of information and condition that down to uh, several pieces of hundred megabytes, and he gets uh, the tins done with that information. So it is very possible. It's it's still very new on our plate right now. And uh, typically, uh, we will take that from Civil 3D and do our trains in Revit. So that's kind of the next flow. If you're going from that to the architectural side, we'll, we'll take whatever they've scanned from uh, and brought into Civil 3D and bring 
and created their 10 surfaces and, and their terrains. And then we bring that point data in to Revit. And I know we can also bring um, Jean's point data from uh, the point uh, into Revit as well and create topo surfaces. I just not have done it. That sounds like, uh, Jean, that sounds like something you and I need to do for the next webinar. So uh, speaking of that, so the, the goal of this project, like Jean was saying earlier, is to preserve that, uh, but is also to do some structural analysis on those existing conditions. And so one of the things, once we got the data from Jean, we then had to bring it into Revit and get that um, data aligned. One of the uh, methods we used to do this was the auto origin to internal origin. This method allowed us to, uh, the point cloud and Revit to align easier. Then we used traditional methods to straighten and move the point cloud to the correct level. Uh, when I did bring this in, it pretty much did kind of go plumb uh, plan wise, but I did have to move it down elevation wise in order to get it to be down to the first floor so I could have that uh, information set up. So I put the UCS in the wrong area. No, no, you did not. You did not. No, your UCS was fine. Uh, ev everything came in perfect. It just typically from your scans, John, we always have to adjust the level because um, your le we don't know what the level is until we get your data in. Once we get your data in, um, then we adjust for the level. And that may be a, a different workflow that, you know, hey, uh, Dave uh, and your team, um, I set this at 100, 100 when I did the scan. So if you set your level one to 100, everything should come in at the correct level. So, and, and it's just, again, you know, like we're doing here, it's the communication and sharing that information uh, amongst us teams and our uh, families that's out there listening right now on the internet. So some of the unique challenges we had um, for this was one is the trust system itself, just, just as Jean was saying earlier. It was a very non-standard containing ornate wood supports and carvings. I remember uh, seeing carvings in there. Now, did we do our, all the carvings? No, we just got the main support system in there and was able to do this. One of the methods we had to do in here was to do model in place because it was not a traditional structure system. I could not use the standard Revit uh, trusses or beam systems, especially with the scan data that was provided to me from Jean. There's just really not an easy way to capture the minute conditions that the client wanted to be able to come in and, and do this. So one of the other challenges with this trust system is you can see here on the truss section how the middle support had different tapering wood, different vertical structures that allowed us to, you know, support those elements. So you can see on the on the left there, there's the scan data with the model, and then you can see on the right that's just the model elements itself. Yes, things will look crooked. You know why? Because they truly are in the real world. They truly are crooked. And if I come to my next one here, the middle support here, as you can see, it was twisted. This middle support had a twist of two to three degrees. Now, could that uh, hurt the structure? Maybe, I'm not a structural engineer. That's what the structural engineers are there for. Is this two to three degree tilt going to suffer or, or take the structural integrity and make it worse. Uh, all right, so the other unique challenges we found in our uh, conversion from Revit or from the point cloud to a Revit model is the main truss system on the north and south of the building or the uh, support, uh, excuse me, the pavilion. We found that it had a bow in there. And so you can see the scan data, the scan and model, model data, and then you can see the model data. If you can look in the middle there, you see that bow. That bow is approximately six inches 
that 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 beam is bowing down. So let me go here. By the way, David, um, this is kind of a question that's more for you, uh, David McQuinn, but I've got a funny feeling this is PJ. Uh, were the Doric columns true Doric columns or family created? So I actually took uh, Jean's uh, scan data and I did an in-place family and created those based on his um, points. So those are true to what he what is actually out on site. They taper just like it tapers in his point cloud. The 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 roundness of it is is just like that. And so that is true, true captured data. It's not just one of those Revit families that we pulled in out of the box or from Revit City or from BIM object. We actually built it based on the point cloud data. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but mm -hmm. isn't one of the defining factors of a Doric column that it does not have a base on it? Uh, Why am I wrong on that? Because I know no, these you're going like... to you're, you're gonna, uh, make me lie because I don't remember myself, but um, <clears throat> whatever data you had in, I did do that. And I, I can pull up the, the Revit model here. Matter of fact, let's, let's go no, ahead and I, do that because... I do have I do have that model open there, and so <clears throat> you know everything you see right there was what was in the scan data, and I can turn the scan data on here. Just doing this for clarity here is everything that's in, in here was in the scan data for that that column. Now, what the the reason why you see floor and steps? It depends on Greek or Roman. Absolutely, Mr. Alvin. I'm, I'm glad you're actually on here. I love your books. As a matter of fact, I, I recommend your books to all the uh, students I teach uh, Revit Essentials course to. So hopefully uh, you uh, like that uh, uh, business coming your way on that. So that's one. <laughs> you're quite welcome. Again, love your books and uh, love uh, how you uh, uh, teach it to the uh, those that don't know uh, computers uh, geek speak so absolutely um, so yes we did take that so the flooring was not important to this client as much as the trust system was important we did a little bit more of what we wanted uh, in here to kind of really flush out this model give them a little bit more than what they asked for So the, uh, so the question was, was the bow at the end of the truss part of the design or did it settle? You know, honestly, I don't know, but I will tell you, um, I would, I, I, just looking at the scan data and the, the photo globes that Jean provided for me, it was a bow in the structure itself. It was not part of the design. So there either was some settling or um, just the different um, being exposed to the elements probably cause that bowage in there. But also too, and I'm going to spin the model around here. Um, you'll notice that there's only four columns on either side of the uh, east and west. And I said north and south. I was thinking plan north and south. So on there, you see there's, there's four columns. So in between there is where the sag is. There's not enough um, support there. But the ones that have six items, I noticed there was little to no sag on those um, beams, but on the trusses on the ends, there was sagging in there up to about six inches. Well, maybe I should bring it into uh, true view rhythm and see if I can do a deficit detection with uh, the beam caliber analysis. Which uh, if, if that is something anyone's interested, there's a plugin for Truvy Rhythm that allows you to uh, detect the true caliber of beams. Just actually, that's an interesting little um, piece of software. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We probably should have sent that report out to them. <laughs> yeah, we should have. Uh, matter of fact, uh, we did give this over to the client that asked us to come in and scan this information and data. They were able to do that. We just have not heard back from them um, on their structural analysis of what they were able to, to do with that data.
yeah, this data is going to a lot of individuals. Um, it's there's a lot of people roped into this. They have uh, specialists in historic wood um, columns coming in. They have uh, like more regular uh, engineers. And if, if there's, there's a few pieces working here. So it was a little difficult to kind of find out what, what uh, things they discovered and how they're going about repairing it. There may also be some in NDAs, but you know, that here they are. Yeah, we did. We did ask permission to at least show this this data here. We just haven't received any structural analysis data from the feedback of what we provided them through the point cloud and the Revit model for them to do additional analysis. Thank you, David, for putting that link in there for everybody to um, um, see and how how they can use that tool to their advantage for flatness and levelness. Um, I know when I was on the GC side. Um, we wanted to do concrete flatness as they poured, but the problem is, is by the time you could get in there with a laser scanner, now granted I was using a competitive product, I was not using our Leica system, I was using a competitor product and wasn't able to get in there and, and scan as they were going. Okay, I see here. I'm reading your message here. How many kinds of challenges? Uh, absolutely. Um, I just, uh, Mr. Ramey or Miss Ramey, um, I'm, I'm terrible with unique names. I apologize. Um, but no, absolutely. Uh, we, um, one of the um, projects I came, when I came on about three years ago, was a um, hospital down in New Orleans, uh, over a million square feet. And um, we noticed there was a one foot drop from one end of the building to the other because obviously with all the um you know hurricanes and flooding and stuff like that in new orleans it caused the building to settle one foot lower in the rest of the building so yes i i can see why you face many a challenges doing that um and i'll say creating the trust system it was a challenge. I had to do a lot of sweeps and uh, blended sweeps and and really come in and build this thing um, here. And I'm gonna turn the, the roof off here just so you can kind of see what some of the other wood framing elements that we had to do in here. So yes, we had to come in and do all this uh, work and I could not repeat all of it. Some of it I could repeat, but then I'd have to go in and twist these elements. Uh, and, and yes, <laughs> I'm glad I said miss. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, I'm hoping I'm hoping this answers your question too, ma'am. So, or I think you were just putting a statement out there, and I'm glad you're sharing that with the group because yes. This is a town hall. We don't want to be the only ones speaking. So if you've got some more information, you want to share something with, with us, put it in the questions or in the chat, and let's talk about it because that's what we're here for. Yes, we're the experts, but we also like to hear from our, our uh, peers out there uh, from coast to coast and around the world of what uh, items you're running into and what solutions did you come up to solve your issues with you know these crazy solutions like John had trying to get this historical data in here and he couldn't damage the floor whatsoever. Or reach the top. <laughs> now she was saying that um, the floors were out of whack. Mm -hmm. Now if you think it, there's a hotel um, on this institute that's on the lake side shore. And it was built in the mid 1800s. And I'm pretty certain it doesn't conform to any modern day standards. The wraparound porch in the front, the level floor wouldn't even meet ADA standards for wheelchairs. It is the, the, a floor that's supposed to be level has more than a seven degree ramp on it in some places. 
Now, if we ever had to go and scan that historical um, hotel, David, I'm sure you're going to need to go have a holiday before or after. <laughs> Maybe even in between. Yeah, I was going to say in between. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, um, I don't know, there's some people that did come in late and maybe people that dropped off, but John asked me, how long did it take me to model this? Once I got his point cloud in and settled in, um, we we track our time on different projects. And I went back in our, our tracking and I showed I logged about 13 hours of, of work doing this pavilion and making all the in-place families based off the point cloud data that John had provided me. And John, you said it took you 13 hours to drive <laughs> to the location. Yeah, well, the, this week was nuts because I had to land in Chicago on Monday. And then I had a job in South Bend on Tuesday. Then I had a job in Cleveland on Wednesday. And then Thursday, I was in Lake Chattanooga, New York. And then I had to fly back on Friday. So I had to drive all the way from Chicago to here. So they always send me, I think that's probably one of the other reasons why no one gave me any stick about duct taping a, uh, laser, a expensive measuring instrument onto an ex, uh, uh, extendable ladder is because by that time I just had enough and I'm like, I will take whatever abuse you want to give me afterwards. I just got to get this job done. Joe, I like your comment here. You know, you scan some ruin sites. I'm curious which ruin sites and, and definitely get that there. <laughs> <laughs> degradation um uh oh two guns arizona okay all right um and degraded random collection points absolutely oh okay yes love it the the navajo and apache ruins i i did not know that that was in uh two guns arizona i'm learning something new and we actually have an office in arizona as well i'm at a, our uh corporate office in arkansas and John is out of California, so we're coast to coast. So, um, Joe, you say you're struggling getting accurate mesh. Are you trying to get mesh from point clouds? And if you are, what laser scan are you using? So just for those that um, don't know my full background, I really cut my teeth on um, uh, high definition scan point clouds to mesh, and the first time I ever had to do it was with a was with a massive natural cave in Texas. And um, the yeah, he said he's got the uh, BLK three sixty Gen one, and he's coming from point clouds and photos. Okay, so um, David actually worked with me uh, last week. You talking um, about me or the other David? No, you, David. Remember last okay. week that uh, that yes. art post job with the column? Yes, so, with the with the uh, decorative uh, arch around the gym. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, unless you're doing like uh, a level three scan with a BLK three sixty, it's not going to give you enough data to get that intricate work. Um, I ended up having to do a hybrid workflow because I went out to a job site without really realizing that they wanted this level of detail. Um, and there was really no way of modeling it. It was all hand carved arches in this um, arch thing above a theater. And when we came back, we were just kind of scratching our heads as to what it was they wanted. And I suggest the solution because I, I'm used to doing uh, point clouds to mesh with more high uh, high resolution scans like RTCs and uh, some of the other competitors, but a BLK 360 at level one and level two is just not going to give you um, enough points. And it's actually a limitation also with the imaging because it needs to get that diffusion. There is a sort of um, photogrammetry hybrid thing that goes on with the points to mesh. So it needs that high resolution photo. So at least try with the BLK 360 Gen 1 to use the HDR setting, which obviously takes the scans and turns it up to four minutes or so. But you may, if there's an area of interest, you have to do the HDR function and the level three scan. Um, yes, we did and has some examples if there's somewhere I can share it. Yeah, I did do a webinar, but um, 
he's trying to get what's happening is that uh, he's got some very unique functions. What did you use to mesh it with, if I'm asked? I, I know I'm completely deviating away from our webinar, but. No, this is actually what our webinar is about. You're, yeah. you're not deviating from it at all. It's a town hall where we can have these discussions like, like this. It's not yeah. just us talking. So absolutely, you're not deviating. Um, uh, well, I have got multiple applications. Cloud Compare, actually. Have you tried um, a recap uh, to mesh? All right, um, also, all right, so you're answering um, that one from David. Yeah, that is the problem when you need to send out multiple passes, it does cost some credits. Um, there is something called um, Mesh Mixer that will allow you to uh, do that for free. It's just not going to give you, um, it's not gonna give you like that instant gratification type thing. If you can figure out how to work with uh, the nodes, you'll be able to fine tune it and it's free, it's open source. Uh, it's called Mesh Mix, so you could try that one out if you'd like, but uh, really what the limitation is, is that um, the BLK360 just doesn't have that level of accuracy that's something like the RTC. So if you are scanning um, some historical sites that have some very intricate data, you may want to have a more of a precision um, tool. But, uh, you know, I, I would be interested to see what the data set looks like to see if you would need to use an RTC or if you can, um, you can use a BLK. But uh, without really seeing kind of your sites and stuff, uh, feel free. All right, I'll send you an email. I'll get in touch with you on that. Sorry, this is kind of like my niche. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see I'll see if I can help you out on that one. Yeah, I'm glad you're here on that because there's no way I would be able to answer answer his questions on that, Jean. <laughs> yeah. No problem at all. And, and matter of fact, uh, this is, you know, uh, the perfect time because I really don't have anything more to show unless you want me to navigate somewhere around the Revit model or the point cloud. But I don't have anything really more to show as far as what we did with this particular project. Was anything captured below? So the only thing we really captured, uh, the client really didn't care about anything below. But because um, it looked odd to me, David, was that I wanted to go in and at least put the steps in there and at least put the flooring in there so it just didn't look so bare. So we gave them a little bit more than what they asked for, but uh, we just did, did that. Um, I know, John, you did capture, I think, the outside edges, but they were not concerned about that. So that's where we just um, kept it, uh, what we provided in the model here. Yeah, so just like in the front area, sort of uh, where your uh, mouse was, uh, the only thing that's really under, there's no cat, well, to my knowledge, there's no catacombs or anything out there. They didn't go full Greek on us. Um, there's only a restroom that's in the front side. So there's a uh, men's on the right and a women's on the left. Um, that's the only thing, and that's in the front. This is kind of on a grade. You're talking about down here, right? Actually, you know what? Both the bathrooms on the right-hand side. The left side's just a flat wall. Yeah. So you can see there's a little pathway that goes to the men's and women's bathroom, but it's just, it's on, it kind of, there's a plateau right at the top, and then there's a steep drop-off that goes down into, um, into the river. And basically, it starts, the construction starts on the plateau, and then the tip of it actually goes into that grade. So there really isn't, it's not elevated or raised off the ground, um, but the only structure, so to speak, underneath it is those restrooms that's in the front right corner. But again, we weren't asked to model that. It's not, it wasn't in the scope. So I didn't feel like getting eaten by mosquitoes longer than I had to.
And you're talking about right there, right, Jean? Yeah. Okay. I did go and then there's a giant spider that like fell off the door when I opened it. So it's <laughs> it's really in nature this place, just by the way. So are there any more questions? Um, <laughs> Did you get a <laughs> scan of the giant spider? <laughs> well, if you saw the noise up, um, so you had a cross section um, in, in your slide deck with all the noise between the pillars. Um, I don't think that is normal, just regular noise that the scanner picks up. That's that a lot of that's buggies. So it's possible I got a few spiders in there. Yeah. <laughs> I did not mean to go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation, but. But yeah, well, no, Jean and I will stay on for any more questions. We definitely thank you for your time. Um, and hopefully this was very educational and benefit for everyone that was on the call today. And if, and, and if you uh, know of some coworkers or fellow colleagues that just couldn't make it, uh, feel free to go to our YouTube channel and make sure they get a chance to come uh, view this. Again, thank you everyone for your time today. And if anybody hears or knows of, you know, uh, off the cuff project that's out of the norm, a historical site, a one-off and, you need to figure out how to get it into a model and you just don't even know where to start. Uh, Dave and I, we've done this a few times. Feel free to reach out to any of us um, and we will do our best to uh, answer and facilitate. And as ATG is we had to capture department has its own scanning service and we have our modeling service. We could, if not tell you how to do it, we can do it for you. You could uh, commission us to do it. So. And also, if you are interested at uh, learning more about the hardware and some of the processes that we use, um, I will put in the um, David, uh, David uh, McQuillan, could you put your email in there? So you could reach out to David uh, if you've got any questions. You'd like to develop your own reality capture department. You can reach out to him. And yeah, we can get you started. And you may even have uh, David Gear or myself kind of showing you how to work with point clouds in your own workflow. And if you need those point clouds turned to a Revit model, please reach out to your local ATG sales rep and they will get you in touch with either myself or someone else from my department so that we can help you with that because um, it doesn't have to be from our scan team. We would prefer it from our scan team because they rock and they know what we're really looking for. So... Yeah, it's fun when you get a big point cloud and you have no idea what to do with it, right, David? Absolutely. We've we've had a few of them. So I, I love I love the way you guys scan them. And when I get stuff from other people, I'm going, yep, nope, our team would have done it a lot differently. And I would have had a little bit more better data than what was provided to me. But, you know, with that, um, again, thank everybody for your time. We'll give you back some more of your day there. And again, if there's any more questions we'll stay on the line here but again thank you everybody for attending this town hall today hey there thanks for tuning in if you like this video make sure to subscribe and check out some of the other content on our channel